Hello everybody, welcome to another video. Today it is the 11th of August. Today we're looking at some really important developments from the Kursk front, looking at additional developments in the offensive day five. We're looking at the Luhansk front, New York, and finishing off with Pokrovsk. Let's zoom in on the offensive activities here. And I won't be able to go too much in depth about the topography, but as the front line does begin to stabilize, we're going to keep a keen eye on whether Ukraine is able to maintain control over key ridges that overlook certain roads in valleys, because that will play a big role in how the fighting really continues to develop over time as we now see the Russians begin with some of their counterattacks in the area where we saw that most evidently was around Suzya, because as you guys may know, over the first few days of the Ukrainian offensive, they were able to first of all solidify control over the western outskirts and western bank of Sujo. So that includes Goncharovka. We have now a lot of evidence of Ukrainian presence over there. And same thing with some of these other suburbs over here. Now, what was always more ambiguous surrounded the eastern portion of the city. So we do know that, for instance, this northern sort of junction where you see the three markers, that is an area where the Ukrainians do still maintain control even as of today along the R200 highway. And that serves as a really important artery for them to continue holding on to territory that is several kilometers further to the northeast. But we do actually have some confirmation of the sorts to show you guys that the Ukrainians are still operating around here. So this is footage that was just released today from the Russian side showing their shelling of Ukrainian positions in northern Suja. So that should just give you an idea of where the demarcation line is generally at. And as I said before, you need to really maintain control over that junction from a Ukrainian perspective in order to continue allowing the Ukrainians to push through with mechanized assets deeper along the R200. But as of now, as you may know, the Russian forces have repelled all efforts to Volshoi Sodatskoy that occurred a day or two ago. And now a lot of the reserves that are coming in, tactical reserves, they are beginning to turn this into a local sort of organization point. And then from there, advancing along the R200 southwards, to try to begin with their counterattacks. So what happened was today, earlier today, you did have a large column of Russian armored forces advancing along the same R200 highway with the hopes of taking back Martinovka. This is really important because taking it back would give the Russians a massive settlement right to the northeast of Suja, which would allow them to just open up additional supply routes and give more support to the difficult state in which the remnants of the 488th Regiment are currently in within the eastern portion of the city. And so it was sort of a relief effort. And so the Ukrainians, their uh, reconnaissance teams were able to spot that column ahead of time. And the Ukrainian columns, first of all, their own armored elements, in addition to infantry armed with MLAs, they were involved in ambushing the Russian column and causing significant destruction to some of the vehicles over there. Although I don't have exact numbers, there is some aftermath footage just showing a lot of burned wrecks from the Martinovka region. And since then, there have been some conflicting reports, some Russian sources mentioning the complete capture of Martinovka. But yeah, for instance, other sources from the Russian side, for instance, saying that it's still under Ukrainian control as the dust settles at the end of the day of August 10th. And the Ukrainians were able to repel all of the Russian assaults today. But that the Russian forces, despite some of the high vehicular damage, which we don't have exactly uh, precise numbers on, we do know that they were able to clear up positions that are located a bit further north. And so this will not be the last attempt to dislodge the Ukrainians from this village. It is very important for the Russians to try to take it over, not just because of the R200, but also because it would undermine the eastern flank of the current Ukrainian groupings stationed in Cherkaskoy, Porechnoy. And yeah, we do have a lot going on around here recently because here we have a video from August 9th which shows additional armored elements either from the 82nd or 80th Air Assault Brigades operating within this village. So we know that it is under the control of the Ukrainians. But the goal for the Ukrainians here is not just to retain control over this village, but then to expand control even further northwards to Ruskoy, Porechnoy. And that's an area where it is basically universally agreed upon now that it is a gray zone with back and forth fighting. And so Russian uh, reconnaissance crews in this case, they were able to spot this column of six Ukrainian vehicles. The, the Russian sources alleged that there were 30 Ukrainian troops in, gen in general operating with this column. 
and that they were able to destroy utilizing Lancets, at least one tank and three armored fighting vehicles. And so you can see the video of the tank getting destroyed over here in the ammo de detonation with the link over here. And so that is confirmation of Ukraine presence, but also of Lancets being uh, very active in this region. Just going a bit further to the south, we do know now that the Russian forces have solidified control over many adjacent tree lines, forested regions that are along the R200, including the region of Krugelik, where there were previously elements of the 22nd Brigade. And that's a unit that was involved in the ambush against Russian forces in Martinovka. And so that's where they're currently located, trying to protect that northern flank of Suja. And this is a big uh, deal for the Russians because a lot of their forces that have come in, the tactical reserves, whether they be local conscripts that are a part of the northern group of forces from Belgorod, from Bryansk, from Kursk, from wherever, whether they be some of the volunteer forces that were located in Donetsk that were very quickly pulled away from where they were operating on the rear to help defend here, or whether they are actually a part of Russia's operational reserves and are now being uh, moved or in the process of being sent to this part of the front line. A lot of them have sort of reorganized with the remnants of the Russian border patrol and the local units manning the border here and try to conduct relief efforts from the northern flank, not utilizing the R200 directly to enter into Suzio, but then just sort of going a bit from the sort of southeastern direction, passing through Pushkarnoi and into Mirny, and that's from where they were able to establish a more solid connection with the remaining uh, Russian companies located in the region. And so that's a success for the Russians in the sense that they've been able to maintain a solid threat of control in contact with the Russian forces here. And they've been able to, over the past 24 hours, essentially cleanse the entirety of the eastern bank of a Ukrainian presence. That includes Makhnovka, where we did know the Ukrainians were operating really since day two. And we have footage that came out today of pictures of the Ukrainians within um, the village itself near churches and such. But the video itself, even coming from Ukrainian sources, they say that it is a couple of days old. And so now what we know, this is also being mentioned by uh, pro-Russia sources. But again, U Ukrainian sources are also essentially agreeing with that at this point, that the Russian forces have been able to clear out the Eastern Bank, including Makhnovka. And actually, they were trying to advance even further westwards and infiltrate into Goncharovka. And that's when the situation became very difficult for the Ukrainians because their sort of southern flank of Suja is relatively weak because the reason why they've been able to get control over here is because the Russian resources on the border were so uh, tenuous. They, there weren't many. So the Ukrainians really in this height region, Krylovka, Melovoy, they don't have many resources committed to that region. And so their southern flank is really exposed. And that puts into threat all of the Ukrainian garrison that is currently beginning to concentrate around Goncharovka and such. So now you had this Russian attempt earlier today to cross over the river. They were able to take over Podol. And we're actually able to begin street-to-street -street fighting in Goncharovka. According to Ukrainian sources, they were able to repel these attacks. So for now, I'm just using the demarcation line as the river. And that originally you had elements of the Free Russia Legion involved in holding back the Russian assaults. And then the tactical reserves from the 99th Battalion of the 61st Mechanized Brigade were moved in. And you could see actually their unit marker over here to just give you an idea of where they're currently operating. And so they were involved in that effort to just repel the Russian assault over the course of the past 24 hours. So now the situation has stabilized. But now, now the issue is the Ukrainians would have hoped when they initially were able to infiltrate into the city, they would be able to turn its entirety into a fortress. But now the only way for that to be possible would be to maintain control over this key junction where the Russians are already really beginning with artillery preparation and beginning to put a lot of their uh, sort of on the ground focus towards. And so the Ukrainians, unless they commit more forces and try to break through the river over here, they will only be able to utilize the western portion of the city as a sort of fortress and as a sort of forward node. And the issue is, had they taken over all of Suja, then they wouldn't have to be worried about a large Russian presence nearby because all of the nearby villages are relatively small and could have also been captured or turned into a gray zone. But now because the Eastern Bank is still under Russian control, any sort of organization for Ukrainian forces here, unless the situation changes, will always be under the direct fire and under the purview 
of the Russian side. And so uh, that's something that you have to keep in mind looking forward. And just going a bit further to the north, I want to look at some other footage from the central axis as I refer to it. This one isn't necessarily important. It's from a couple of days ago. This is very interesting. This occurred on the night of uh, August 9th going into August 10th. It was a, apparently, according to uh, Russian sources, Rybar mentioned this in particular, there were 15 vehicles. I think it included two Bradleys and it may have included T-80s, T-64, something of that sort. And so it was a mix of tanks and infantry fighting vehicles, of course, for dismount operations. And it was probably a rather large DRG effort, which we are still seeing from the Ukrainians. They really do want to continue with DRG operations in order to prevent the Russians from beginning to create a solid perimeter north of the line of contact in order to really cause more chaos. And maybe uh, if they're being optimistic, sort of prepare the battlefield for any sort of future advances. But for now, the DRG units that are continuing to operate at night. And we talked uh, in last yesterday's video about Russian or Ukrainian attempts to infiltrate towards Semenovka. We knew about a presence they reported by Russian sources in Ivnitsa. So that was eventually repelled by the Russians in the region. But it appears that a new axis was formed overnight by the Ukrainian DRGs. Actually a really deep advance through the fields that the Russians only spotted about 12 kilometers in. And that's when they called in Iskander strikes on the forested region where they were located. Now, I don't know if that caused any sort of destruction to the vehicles here. It's just very hard to see. But the allegation coming in from Russian sources is that it was spotted and then eventually cleared out. And this was probably a battalion tactical group from the 80th Air Result Brigade with some sort of additional infantry fighting vehicle support from the 82nd Brigade because they are working in lockstep. And so that should show you that when I give you guys a solid line of contact, that's not always indicative of the actual reality. The situation is still fluid where the Ukrainians can take advantage of these massive open areas and forested regions and unprotected roads to advance still relatively deep. Uh, that advance, if we're looking at it, is about uh, 20 kilometers away from Lagov. But those sort of infiltration attempts, they're not able to get any more uh, close and their quantity is not enough to secure any sort of a massive uh, control over the heights that overlook Lugov. And so for now, the immediate Russian concern of preventing the capture of that region has been definitely averted and we can look closer to the border for the future developments. Zooming in a little bit, I want to see if there's some other videos around here that are worth noting because we do have videos of some Russian airstrikes and artillery operations towards uh, various Ukrainian infantry squads and all of these various armored vehicles in the region around Leondov, Leonidovo. And it's important to note because this is one of the regions, the Western Axis, where there is the, uh, the most disagreement from both sides about where the line of contact is. And I think mine is sort of like a synthesis of both. Uh, but that's not always accurate as well, because uh, we do know, according to Rybar, over the past 24 hours, the Ukrainians have been able to expand their zone of control north of Lyubyomovka and advance about maybe five kilometers, taking over positions that may be around this really large forested complex just southeast of Koronovo and also along that same key road leading to that city. And they also mentioned by the end of today, uh, end of August 10th, that there were Ukrainian DRG operations in Zhuravli. And so we don't know that for sure. Ukrainian sources aren't really talking about it much. And there is, of course, a lot of dispute about the status of villages such, such as Olgovka, Snagost, Obuchovka, and Kremianoi. Because, for instance, some sources like Deep State don't really have these marked as under the control of the Ukrainians, but Rybar still does. And if those reports are to be true, then it means that the Ukrainians, their goal now should be to continue solidifying control over these various villages on roads to Koronovo and on hills overlooking it. That would really shape the battlefield in a way that the Ukrainians could attack deeper towards that city. But that's, of course, under the assumption that the Ukrainians really do control those areas, because if not, then they first have to try to solidify uh, their sort of sort of strengthen that area. And for now, what we do know at the very least is that they are in an area like Lyubyomovka or Novo Ivanovka. But the Russian forces within Koronovo itself, they have moved in large quantities of trucks, a lot of armored vehicles, artillery pieces, uh, not here, but a bit further north, moving into the Rilsk area. 
and a lot of troops as well. So now they're beginning to solidify control over here. A lot of those uh, sort of tactical reserves that I mentioned, they're coming into here right now. And it's going to make it very difficult for the Ukrainians to launch frontal assaults onto the city. And so that makes it all the more uh, really uh, necessary and important that the Russians were able to repel the initial assaults on Kornovo on the first two days of the Ukrainian offensive over here. If we look way, way farther north, we could see here on the E30 highway, here is just some, some construction work being done by the Russians in Oktabirsky Rayon, uh, part of Korsk Oblast, and it's just south of the nuclear power plant. So it seems the Russians are now uh, beginning to take this threat seriously and just as some sort of insurance have defenses even deeper into the oblast. But of course, the fighting is still uh, dozens of dozens of kilometers away and has actually been constricted in uh, the past 24 hours. Uh, there's also been a lot of information from Google Maps looking at the traffic congestion between the roads in Voronezh and then going west to Kursk. A lot of the training facilities and the sort of initial enlistment offices, they're located in Voronezh. So it makes a lot of sense that the roads from there to Kursk would just be filled to the brim with vehicles. On the one hand, a lot of it is coming from civilians. But then, of course, a lot of it is from troops that are being moved westwards to begin fighting and from Kursk, they get dispersed to the various locations. And then there's the issue that, you know, a lot of data from Google Maps is based off of the uh, the phones that are being uh, utilized along those roads. And so then there's a question of whether the conscripts that are being moved into the front line, the Russian ones, whether they still have their phones on them, which makes them immediately uh, really uh, under threat of being spotted by the Ukrainians and then having, of course, some artillery strikes to launch towards them. And so that's something that the Ukrainians will be looking out for because right now, as they see the amount of reserves mounting up, they're really, it's going to be incumbent upon them to try to degrade the speed and the quantity of which they're coming to the front line as soon as possible in order to allow the Ukrainians to continue maintaining a numerical superiority and also just a, an equality edge, a qualitative edge in some of the cities where they are engaged right now in various fierce battles, most notably Suja. Now, when it comes to the operational reserve of the Russian forces that I was talking about, there are uh, unverified claims in the same way that there were unverified claims about Ukrainian troop movement. Uh, I talked about it actually on my first video about the offensive that I estimated around 10,000 Ukrainian forces to be in the general sphere of Sumy involved in the uh, offensive operation. And then you could say maybe uh, one or 2,000 actually crossing the border at the current moment and generally 6,000 that are uh, deeply committed to the fighting. Now, that, those were my general estimates, and it seems that now it's being backed up by Forbes because they, they wrote an article where they had a very similar estimates. I was just going off of like my own estimates of unit sizes and their alleged locations over here. And now looking at the Russian side, they are, uh, at least according to some pro-Russia telegram channels, moving in specific units. I'll, I'll list them all in the next video, but uh, just off the top of my head. A lot of them are smaller battalions that are coming in from parts of the front line that have less engagement. So, for instance, Kherson, Zaporozhye, to a certain extent, Luhansk, also even in Kupiansk, some are being moved away from. And that's an area that actually is sort of hot right now. And so that would be a sort of minor issue because it's only a few units from the Kupiansk area. But nonetheless, you could also see how the Russians are, of course, trying to take away from the lowest uh, importance uh, from the fronts that are lowest on the pecking order first and you could see that's good news and bad news for the ukrainians it's good news in the sense that the ukrainian offensive has been uh, so significant that it has forced the russians to move in forces from various oblasts all across the front line then the other uh, downside would be that if the russians are able to send them all in this operational reserve and that's enough then it won't really distract the ground forces that are operating in the current offensives in New York and Pokrovsk from continuing to advance utilizing their same manpower. So obviously keep that in mind, but also keep in mind the fact that the Air Force has largely been diverted towards uh, dealing with the situation over here. And so that also, of course, helps the Ukrainians a lot by just relieving some pressure away from Pokrovsk, where the Air Force was, again, operating uh, really heavy uh, handedly. Looking a bit westwards, there are reports of just Artillery shelling by the Ukrainians towards Setkino, uh, a lot of issues with internets, a lot of the communications here between Russian ground forces are just cut off. I think that's all a part of a, a larger sort of sabotage operation across the border to make it more difficult for the Russians to ignore these regions, to make them more stretched out, more panicked, uh, all of the above. Uh, but we don't have any information about movement in Tedkino. 
We did have information about movement if we're going further to the southeast in Belgorod region in this um, village over here, Poroz. You had the Georgian Legion and the 252nd Territorial Defense Battalion of the 241st Brigade crossing over the border and filming a video within the village. But then they promptly left earlier today and the mayor or yeah, the governor of the Belgorod Oblast, he came to visit over here and confirmed that the Russians were able to take it back. So uh, for now, it's located under Russian control, but you can see there is a massive span of the border that is currently not that well defended, especially given the fact that a lot of resources are being moved to the northwest. And so that leaves a lot of gaps along the Belgorod front or Bryansk front. And so uh, that's going to give Ukrainians opportunities to not create any sort of serious offensive activities but to create a lot of panic and confusion and redirect forces by creating these sort of temporary border raids, utilizing the same forces that have been known for doing it over the past year and a half. Now, looking at the Luhansk front, we do have some really important changes over here. A lot of territorial gains over the same period of time in a way that we haven't seen much from this region. So just starting north, the Russians are taking it seriously, the capture of all of Tabaivka, which I've said is uh, really necessary for them to do, because at that point, once you take Tabaivka, you also get control over all the nearby forested regions and also the height located just to the west. And it takes all the pressure off the Russians that advance in Pishchane, because at that point, they uh, no longer are this very narrow salient, but they have uh, much more depth and a much stronger northern flank. So here the Russians captured about, let's see, about 4.5 square kilometers, very significant gain. And they're also approaching this trench system over here, three kilometers max, going a bit southwards. Also, once again, a lot of these uh, operations have been characterized by just solidifying flanks for villages that Russian armored forces and then dismounted infantry were able to take earlier this summer and spring. So here you can see a gain of about 6.7 square kilometers just southeast of Barostove. It's an advance of about 4.5 kilometers, really large area. And it's also just north of Selmakivka, which serves as one of the largest nodes of the defense for the Ukrainians along this chain of villages that is defending the front line right now. You could also see some other advances made by the Russians through other tree lines here. So that's what they're mainly doing, sending in forward elements through tree lines, sometimes on foot or on motorcycles. And you could see the most significant development has been just east of Zambakivka, where the Russians have been able to capture 6.4 square kilometers, taking over large swaths of fields, including some of the tree lines that lead directly into the village. And so now you can see a concerted effort by the Russian uh, garrison here to attack on all sides and attack through tree lines and really knock on their doorstep, making it impossible for the Ukrainians to send in a large amount of reinforcements or organize themselves in a way that would not be visible to the Russians and then be targeted by them immediately. So now you're beginning to see the initial stages of the development of Selmakivka which would play a role in breaking down one of Ukraine's sort of last standing, strong, solid defense lines in this region. And then we'd be looking at a Russian advance or a Russian opportunity to advance several kilometers westwards until you reach the next populated area in Lozova, about, let's see, about seven kilometers westwards. We only have one update today from the Turetsk front. We're going to zoom in on the northern suburb of Druzba. This is an area where we didn't have a lot of information about some of the dachas that are near the Bakhmutovka River. Here we have an advance by uh, the Russians. You can see it's not a massive one, but it does confirm to us that the Russians are in control of the northeasternmost parts of this suburb as a result of a gain amounting to about 400 meters. So in the video, you could see just constant FPV strikes by the 28th Mechanized Brigade targeting the Russians in houses and in, of course, their ruins. So we know the Russians are now beginning to clear out these regions. And their next goal, as we said before, is to advance into the northern part of Druzba, as that would give them a really important standing to begin to push deep into western Pivnishnia. And more generally, the goal then is to have a strong sort of infiltration force on that eastern flank to begin knocking on the doorstep of Toretsk. But then again, that is longer term. There's only one sort of frontline change from Pokrovsk over the past 24 hours, and that is coming from Ivanivka. The Russian forces are uh, in, on the verge of fully capturing it. They've essentially done so. There are a few more houses that you could see 
Still were fringe houses on the northwestern side that still need to be cleared out before the most part of the Russian forces are in control of this region. We also know this based on footage from the 35th National Guard Regiment, which was released on August 9th, showing shelling of Russian forward positions first with 122 millimeter shelling, and then the troops that survived that were targeted by FPVs. And that also confirms to us a new unit is defending around here. And as a lot of organized brigades have had elements move elsewhere or were fully uh, detached from this part of the front line, you're seeing a lot of the slack being filled by smaller units like separate rifle battalions, or in this case, National Guard regiments. So they're involved in the defense here to plug in holes. And their unit marker, I believe, is this one over here, as you can see. And it's important that the Russians are advancing through uh, Ivanivka because uh, here you can see it's a 1.1 square kilometer gain, and it's an advance in the western direction of about 1.5 kilometers it means that there's going to be a serious russian um, sort of flank serious russian position that is amassing just east of hordivka and it's already bad for the ukrainians that the russians have access to this road leading directly into the center of hordivka but then also having all of these fields including some hills just to the northwest of ivanivka that overlook Rodivka, that's going to make the defense even more difficult as it begins to get enveloped from several directions. And that's what the Russians want. They want to create the same conditions in Rodivka as they've been doing in every single smaller village around here, whether it be Jelane or Vesele. The list really goes on and on. Now they want to emulate it for the first time on a larger settlement. This will be the largest one that the Russians engage in since Avdivka. And so it will be a big test to see whether the Ukrainians could amass the reinforcements here and hold the line in some of their defensible areas, maintain control of flanks, and also continue to, of course, control supply lines and in the proper resources, despite all of the movements that are occurring elsewhere on the front line. So just don't forget about Hodivka. It's going to be so important and we're going to be covering it more in detail in future videos. And lastly, once again, looking at Kostantinivka, I just have to look at it once again because we do have new footage. We're getting pretty regular updates from this region due to footage coming out from the 79th Air Assault Brigade. They're very active in repelling the near constant Russian assaults. They reported on August 10th, there were three Russian attempts to break through the line and get control over the village. And we can see some of the footage from that over here, for instance, this is of a drone dropping on grenade, uh, drones dropping grenades on the houses in the ruins of houses, of course, within the southeastern corner. Here you can see that uh, this is a longer video. It's just various FPV strikes on houses and dugouts of the Russian infantry that make it all the way to here in their armored assets along various routes through roads or through open fields. And then at some point their vehicles are damaged or they're forced to abandon them. And then they begin hiding in different landing points, sometimes under the vehicles, as I said before, dugouts and ruins. And that's when the 79th Brigade, their drone crews have to be involved in finding them and individually taking them out. And so based on that footage, we know that the Russians have been able to get additional foothold in the region. Uh, not anything too massive, but it is just a smaller chunk that is coming under Russian control. And it does mean that the Russians are advancing adjacent to this local pond that also connects to Parskovivka to the east. And so the Russians advanced about, let's say, 600 meters northwestwards. But the heartland of the village and most of the Ukrainian positions that are actually manned are still under their control. And so, yeah, that's all I have for today. Thank you all for watching, and I'll see you guys in the next video. Goodbye.